Welcome to the Unveil podcast and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Leslie Ellis all about dreams and I reveal a secret uh, some way through this podcast where I used to be the kind of person that quote doesn't really dream. Well Leslie is here to completely bust that myth but also to show you how to work with dreams. We have a brilliant conversation all about the psychology and the theories and the background of dream analysis work and we really dig into the weeds of Leslie's work and how she encourages people to work with their dream as effective content for their daily life. Well, who is Dr. Leslie Ellis? Leslie Ellis, PhD, RCC, is a registered clinical counsellor, teacher and author who lives and works in beautiful Deep Cove, British Columbia. Leslie has in-depth, specialised training in focusing-oriented therapy and is expert in its use for treatment of trauma. A specialist in somatic approaches to therapy, Leslie has studied somatic experiencing, the Hakomi method, and Soma Yoga. She has developed a method of embodied experiential dream work which combines focusing with Jungian active imagination techniques. And we explore both of those things during this podcast. We talk about what focusing and what the focusing method is, and we also speak about Jungian imagination techniques. Dr. Leslie Ellis is a leading expert in the use of somatic approaches in psychotherapy, in particular for working with dreams, nightmares, and the effects of trauma, and we do talk about nightmares and how to work with them. She is the author of A Clinician's Guide to Dream Therapy and offers many training opportunities in embodied experiential dream work based on her book. She has a PhD in clinical psychology from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology with a specialization in somatic approaches. Her dissertation, which again we discuss in this podcast, on using focusing-oriented therapy to treat PTSD for refugees with recurrent nightmares won the Ernest Hartman Award for the International Association for the Study of Dreams. So if you thought that dream analysis and dream working and working with dreams to support the daily life and trauma was sham science, I hope that just that introduction alone will make you realize Leslie's credentials in this area and that this whole episode shows you not just that this is an area of science that you could focus on, but also practical tools for how to start looking toward your own dreams for inspiration, insight, and personal development. And with that, here's Leslie. So welcome to the Unveil podcast, Leslie. I'm really delighted for this conversation today. Oh, I'm excited to be here, Victoria. It's really <laughs> yeah, it's really and I think, yeah, and I think this is going to be different, and which is why I always love different, and I always love people who have like a really specific lens on this field of healing and humaning. And so I'd like to start, as I always do, by inviting you to share with my listeners and now our listeners for today, the sort of 30,000 foot view of who you are and what you do. And I always like to ask it in a specific way. So it's, how do you serve? How do I serve? I love that question. And do you know, I think a simple way to put it is that um, my, my work life in particular, but also uh, to some degree my personal life, is in service to my dreams. And the dreams themselves uh, I have used as a touchstone in throughout my life and in clinical practice as well. And it's interesting, I think, because a lot of times people have used dream work as kind of an intellectual exercise, like finding, figuring out what the dream means and what it, what it says about your personality. But I tend to try and ask the question differently, like how can we be in service to our dreams? And so that, um, that's basically how I, I serve. There's a lot more I could say, but that's, that's a simple answer. For sure. I love it. And I love people who give me the concise answer to begin the podcast because people will already be fascinated because being in service to our dreams, what does this mean to you? So I'm thinking already like, oh, I dream that I can one day be, uh, I don't know, a West End performer or a Broadway star. And it's, I'm, I'm getting the sense that this is not the dreams that you're talking about. So give us a bit more of a perspective on what does it mean to you to be in service to your dreams? Well, partly it's um, paying attention to them, taking them seriously. Mm -hmm. So having a practice of uh, recording dreams that um, that you remember, especially the ones that feel really important, and mm -hmm. then not just writing them down, but uh, diving into them a little deeper and really paying attention to the characters that show up and what they're what they're bringing, what they're asking. I do. Um, I've started doing more um, of an active imagination practice with my dreams, where I don't mm -hmm. just 
work with the dream itself, but I also go into maybe having a dialogue with dream characters and seeing what they're um, what they're wanting to say. Not so much to, like I said, find out the nuances of what I should do with my life or how it how it depicts my personality, but more like seeing the dreams as autonomous, as messages from maybe the larger psyche. And in that way, they become like a companion, but one that's very, very wise and old and, mm. and larger than me. Mm -hmm. mm. There's so much to dig into here, but I'm going to start at the beginning because this feels like a very specific niche of interest. It's like, it's not the first one that comes to my mind. So I'm really fascinated. How did you get here? Like, what was the trajectory? Because I usually find that people don't not necessarily start on this thing, or it's the one thing that they were always fascinated by. So I'd love to understand your kind of like route through to get to where we are with this dream uh, basis and foundation. Yeah, so I've always been interested in dreams from a very young age. I've, you know, tracked them and written them down. Um, and but I didn't start really making them a focus of my life until I would say um, I became a psychotherapist maybe 25 years ago. And before that, I was a journalist and then I was kind of looking for something different and went to back to school to get my master's in um, counseling psychology. And I went to Pacifica Graduate Institute. So as part of my psychotherapy training, we learned a lot about how to work with client dreams. And I really did think that this was just normal because the, um, you know, the initiation of the psychotherapy profession was by Jung and Freud, and they were all about dreams. And Adler, you know, dream work was really normal at the very beginning of our profession. And I suppose because of my, you know, my training, I didn't realize how much of a, a fringe element it, it has become, mm. except if you're a Jungian or a Freudian analyst right. or you specifically want that. So I, I had the training. And so as a, um, I became a therapist and worked a lot with, uh, with trauma and always used dream work as part of my practice. And I would find that um, a combination actually of dream work and, and something called focusing, which is a, mm -hmm. a, a gentle somatic practice, a way of listening to the body. And they really pair very beautifully. And so it's a practice that I find really deepens the conversation, helps um, the client get beyond the sort of typical what's wrong kind of attention and more into what's what's wanting to um, carry them forward. It's a very different approach I found out. I didn't realize it when I first started. It was a long time ago and it wasn't, uh, all the somatic approaches weren't so mainstream yeah. and dream work was very fringe. And, and so uh, I, I really just found that those sessions, especially when someone brought a big dream, were so transformative, so moving. And, and I was also training at the time Considering becoming a Jungian analyst, although I didn't end up choosing that, I was doing my own dream work. And uh, for years, I was, you know, writing down my dreams, drawing my dreams, taking them to my therapist. And some of my most profound personal sessions were were based on, on dreams. Mm -hmm. And uh, so later on, um, I'll try to make this short, but later on, I just decided, look, I was looking for some more training. So I went back to school and got my doctorate and I wanted to do something related to dreams. So I thought I would choose something that was practical because I wanted, I want to bring dream work back into the, um, the field of psychotherapy more, uh, you know, more strongly than it is. And so I thought, well, nightmares are a clinical diagnosis and they're very, mm -hmm. uh, very prevalent in those with post-traumatic stress injury. And they, they're the, the kinds of dreams that clients are most likely to bring. Mm -hmm. And so I did my research on working with a group of refugees and working with their nightmares and developed a nightmare treatment and I've discovered some things about nightmares that I feel like are really important clinically. And so um, I, I wrote a book about dreams and, um, you know, a few years back, three years back. And now I, instead of working with clients, I have very few clients, just a small handful that I, that I still see, but mostly I teach therapists how to work with dreams. So I'm taking this incredible um, avenue for therapy and trying to um, give that to therapists who want it, who don't have 
the knowledge and feel like they they're missing it you know to fill the gap basically Mm, mm, I love that okay and so I have so many questions one is why you mentioned that you contemplated becoming a Jungian analyst why was that not the choice was there something because I my bias to some of this stuff is that some of those the old school psychiatrists seemed to be a little bit um specific about the way they analyze or it, it was all about sex or it was all about your parents or it was all about like everything seemed to be very reductionist down to very few things so I've always had this uh, aversion to dream analysis because it's felt very very fixated on the originator so I'm really interested in your thought process the decision not to go the Jungian route where you're at with kind of like the old school and what's different about what you do Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Big question. So yeah, you, you're referring to the, the Freudian idea, like of everything yeah. being symbolic of something sexual yeah. or, you know, having the um, the dream symbols be kind of preset and in, in Jungian psychology as well, there's a lot of preset symbology. And yeah. I don't really, um, I think there's a, you know, there's been a, um, an evolution, especially in the Jungian circles and the depth psychologists have a lot more of a Okay. Embodied and more creative take, and some right. of the more um, sexist kind of things have been. They have evolved, but still, the Jungians um, can tend to be a little heady because of the writings of Jung. They're quite dense and and uh, difficult to follow, and it seems to to attract a certain <laughs> like a, probably the majority of Jungians are are quite intellectual and will mm-hmm. give you an intellectual interpretation of your dreams. And um, I did train in a Jungian orientation, but it was more experiential. Mm -hmm. And I've taken it even further into an experiential um, way of working. I feel like that's the 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 the, um, bias that you have is a very commonly held one. Mm -hmm. That dream work is this intellectual, um, antiquated, uh, difficult. Um, approach that really um, isn't relevant today and um, that you have to have all this specialized training and that you're going to tell someone what their dream means and it isn't going to land with them or you know isn't a very sort of modern day way to practice Mm -hmm. and it's true of those old methods and so it, it isn't why I rejected becoming a Jungian analyst it was partly um logistical because there wasn't really an analytic training in Vancouver where I was living I would have had to travel to Toronto and um yeah and then at the end of the day I I I thought what I end up with with that much effort may not be what I want I wanted to um, teach at a university at first Mm -hmm. and so I thought a a doctorate would be more of a practical Mm -hmm. I was going to put a lot of that um uh, energy into an uh an educational endeavor I thought that a doctorate would be maybe a better choice. I was really, you know, going to do one or the other, certainly not right. both. So, yeah. so I, I do think the Jungian approach though, um, the more I get, uh, I definitely am influenced by it, but the more I get um, into sort of my own uh, way of working, the more I see some of that stuff, the, the ideas that dreams have prescribed meanings that your opposites, you know, opposite gender, um, characters in your dream or your anima or your animus and they rep black represents the shadow and all of this prescribed symbology I don't really think it always fits I don't like dream dictionaries for that reason as well I mm-hmm. think our symbols are very unique to us mm-hmm. and the, that the best way to fit to find out what a dream is telling us is to enter into it experientially in an embodied way and really the dreamer is the one who can ultimately um, decide what the dream message is and not the dream worker. And that's really changed uh, mm-hmm. since the beginning of dream work. And so it's not um, unique to me, though. It's really the whole field has gone that way. It's it become more experiential mm-hmm. and more of a, a collaborative uh, endeavor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and and I know you say that you're not working with many clients at the moment, but what is a a dream work session look like for somebody who's like, well, what do you mean? Like, what, what do you do? Like I'm coming to you. I've had, do I, do I have to bring a dream? Do you, I do help me find a dream? <laughs> How does it work? So usually you bring a dream. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, although I do have some ways to help bring a dream like experience. If you don't remember dreams, which is true of some people, but typically, yeah, people will come and go, well, I had this dream and I always 
tell my clients and I foresee them that I work with dreams and invite them. And so even though a lot of people will say, oh, I don't remember my dreams at all. When I, when I say, you know, dreams are welcome here, it's interesting how many of them will suddenly have a dream or something that will come to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I usually am, ask them to write it down because so much of, of our dream details get lost when we don't write them down. So I suggest, yeah. you know, when you first wake up, before you move your body, before you do anything else, um, think you might think that you're not going to forget what you just dreamt, but it so easily slips away. So mm -hmm. I invite people to yeah write down everything they can remember about their dreams immediately and bring that. And uh, and then I just first of all just get them to tell me the dream, starting with they might want to read it out loud to me to um, jog their memory. Yeah. And then I ask them to put the put the put the book down and go back into the dream as if they are uh, experiencing it. So from first person, present tense, walking through the dream and letting the details and the, and the environment of the dream come back to life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think this is um, something I learned from a, a Jungian um, named Robert Bosnick, who was talking about how you really can only work with dreams that are alive. And they could mm -hmm. be dreams from 10 years ago, even a long time ago, or they could be very current. But the, the idea is that you need to still be able to go into the dream and see it and feel it. And it needs to still have some connection, not just words on a page that you don't have a relationship with, but something that you can feel into. And so I invite people to just tell the dream slowly and feel into it. And, and if new things come up that they didn't remember, um, to tell me those two, because oftentimes when you walk back into a dream experientially, there's details there that you didn't write down or that you didn't, you, you just remember as you're working with it. And mm -hmm. so I start with that, really just getting the person immersed in the dream. Mm -hmm. And then I have developed a, um, a specific method now, after all this time, I, I, I start with something called finding the help, which is uh, from focusing from Eugene Genlin's um, mm -hmm. practice. And he has a book called Let Your Body Interpret Your Dreams. And mm -hmm. in it, he suggests that um, this is the one thing you should always do with a dream is that every dream presents some kind of a um, an issue or a lack or a something in the way you live that needs attention, but it also brings the help that you need to look at it, to change it, to shift it. And that finding and embodying this help in the dream is the only thing you really need to do is what he suggests. I think there's more, but I, I think it's an excellent place to start because yeah. especially if it's a troubling dream or a challenging dream, finding those resources, it's like trauma work, finding the resources first mm -hmm. makes it much easier to then look at what's what's maybe more difficult. Mm. So I'll ask them just outright, you know, what in the dream seems to be the most helpful thing or the most ener energetic thing or the most interesting thing or that what really gets your attention in the dream? What are you most drawn to? Mm. And it, it can be a character, an object, anything. Um, and so I'll start with having them find the felt sense of the help. Felt sense is also a, a term from focusing. It's been used in a lot of other things like SE has picked it up as well. Um, but it's it's just getting a, a, a the body's kind of take on something. And it's a it's not just a physical sensation, although it can come in that form, but it's a it's a, a way of of feeling it that gives you a um, something that comes before words, but that actually has a lot in it, you know, a lot more than you could initially say. And yeah. getting a felt sense of the help in a dream, feeling it in, in your body is where I start. And that, you know, is a practice I just started to do later in my work with dreams. Uh, I started off just with my Jungian training, doing it um, the way I was taught. But, but when I decided to incorporate this part, it really made the dream work shift into something so much more constructive right. so yeah so I sort of start with that mm -hmm. finding the help and then from there it really can go in many different ways it kind of depends on what the dream brings and mm -hmm. and um so it's it's not so formulaic but I would say that once a person feels bolstered by the help then we can go and start to explore you know maybe chronologically or maybe systematically yeah. Uh, the things in the dream that seem important to mm -hmm. pay attention to. 
And we go into them by, um, again, experientially, by uh, walking in right into the dream, having conversations with dream characters, becoming dream elements, this gestalt idea of mm -hmm. if you're, uh, you know, you have this very striking um, object or animal in the dream that seems mysterious, I suggest they become that. Imagine they're, you know, coming from that sub subjectivity and seeing what that's like. Mm -hmm. And it, it, there's like very many ways to, to uh, enter into the dream experience and to really let the dream kind of work on the dreamer versus the dreamer working on the dream. The dream kind of comes into them. And yeah, it's hard to know. Uh, I can't describe it much more, more specifically than that because it so much depends on the actual dream itself and yeah. the dreamer. Mm -hmm. Which I love and I love that it feels so non-prescriptive because I think when I got into this work a very long time ago, we had those dream dictionaries. Like if you're running, it means X, Y, Z. If you're falling, it means X, Y, Z. If like, it's, just, it, it's always the same thing. And it just, it either doesn't translate or it feels like, well, yeah, but that was the underlying thing, but there's so many details. Um, and I, I love the kind of, uh, the somatic way you're approaching this. A lot of my listeners will have recognized all the words that you used. We had Jan Winhall on who discussed the felt sense polyvagal model and worked a lot with Jen Lynn. So if anyone wants to, we'll tag that in the show notes so people can go back and listen and get a bit more of an idea of this felt sense and felt shift. But I feel like this, just using this in dream stuff, now you've said it, it sounds so supremely obvious, but I wouldn't have thought of it beforehand because it's just like that dream thing lives over there in the nighttime in the crazy world of like, which leads, leads me on to my next question. And this may be a non-starter and you may be like, this isn't my area of interest, but I'm like, what is dreaming? What, what, how, how is dreaming stimulated in your opinion? And you can give me the kind of weird explanation or a science explanation. It's like, what, what, what's happening in our brains when we're dreaming? So there's um, a lot of uh, information about that that we didn't have until recently because we've been able to kind of look at the dreaming brain. Mm. And I think at first, you know, it, it was in the 60s, they discovered REM sleep and, and that we do have a lot of activity in our brain when we're not just unconscious and that the REM period of sleep is when we're, most of our intense dreaming happens, although we can dream at other stages, sleep stages as well. So there's a whole architecture of sleep that happens. So we're, are, there are many cycles and it starts with really deep sleep. And if, you know, the REM cycles are start off short and they get longer at, toward morning. And so there's, you know, four or five periods of REM total of about 90 minutes or two hours of REM. And, you know, dream workers and dreamers are mostly interested in the REM period of sleep because that's where the most interesting dreaming happens. I mean, we do have non-REM dreams that are kind of a little more basic, and um, in each of the sleep stages has different functions. And um, that, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother topic. That's a whole nother but, podcast, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, so in REM, what's really interesting is that um, what happens in your brain is that your prefrontal cortex, your thinking brain, your, your executive functioning is pretty damped down, um, almost completely shut down. And uh, unless, you, unless you're able to become lucid and then there's a little bit more activity, but most dreamers are, you know, the prefrontal cortex um, is not really online, which is why I think in our dreams, um, the dream ego is often lost and confused and we can't, you know, make our appointments. We can't get to the airport. We can't, because our, our logical functioning is really not available. But what is available, it's actually more available than even when we're waking is our limbic system and our emotional system and, and our visual, um, visual cortexes, cortices are, are more active. And so we have, what um, a really famous dream researcher named Ernest Hartman called um, what we're dreaming of is picture metaphors of the prevalent emotion that is mm. um, happening in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And I, I really do think that that's a, an accurate description um, that we, we dreaming is implicated in emotional regulation and memory consolidation. That's what the dream researchers say is, is happening. And mm -hmm. it's hard to study dreaming directly because it's something that happens when you're not able to communicate what's going on. I mean, yeah. except very, very rudimentary ways you can, you know, teach someone how to become lucid and signal with their eyes as, which is what they do to show that someone's actually awake in there, but mm -hmm. that's not a lot of information, you know? Mm -hmm. So so we have to go with um, reports after the fact and and, and mm -hmm. images of dreaming brains and 
um, you can put someone in an fMRI and you can you can watch what's happening in their brain. But uh, if you've ever been in an MRI, they're very loud banging. And so I don't know if it's if it's their typical sleep that you're seeing. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's all um, it's all a bit murky. That research is fascinating, and there's we don't have a def- definitive sense of of what um, what goes on in our brains when we're dreaming. But there is a book called When Brains Dream um, mm-hmm. by Tony Zedra and I forget the other author, but it's it's a pr- really good description of the dream research and that end of things and what happens mm-hmm. in your brain. It's very interesting. Mm-hmm. And so there's that piece of dreaming is, being, is, is this um, a sense of um, what's happening in our, in our emotional life, in our, in our bodies, and how do we create a picture of that that is going to help us regulate, I think is a, a good way to think about dreaming. Mm-hmm. And then also um, there's this uh, memory consolidation, which happens when we're sleeping yeah. and dreaming seems to be a part of that because when mm-hmm. we dream about things, we tend to have better recollection of it. So mm-hmm. working, you can extrapolate that in dreaming, there's there's a way that it's helping us lay down memory Mm. And so one of the um, people who dream dream uh, researchers who I really love is uh, her name's Josie Malinowski. And she was wrote an article talking about th- this um, memory consolidation and how that happens. It's, a, it's all theory. We really don't know. But yeah. one of the things is that when you're going through your day, there's like a million things that happen. How do you figure out what's important to remember and what doesn't get remembered? Because there's no way we can uh, lay down long-term memories of everything that we experience. That would be impossible. So um, what we seem to be designed to do is recall the things that get a rise out of us. So if something triggers an emotion, that's our body's way of saying that is important to remember, even if the emotion's unconscious, even if we don't actually realize that it that it that it you know might touch on some very deep and um, historic thing. It can be you know seeing um, something flash by that that actually creates a response. And then when we're dreaming, the idea is that these um, these images that we are, the the dreaming brain will take just the piece of it that's important to remember and put it into an associative network Mm -hmm. of the things that are like that. So you'll dream about, um, you know, someone from high school in your childhood home and there'd be temporal anomalies, but there will be a link. And it was so that when you need that information, it's in the place where related things are. So Mm -hmm. it makes sense of the, um, the strangeness of dreaming. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one theory. Mm -hmm. And you know, that those are, those are from the sort of the dream research world and they feel true. And then there's also the, the interesting thing that dreaming seems much bigger than that and seems bigger than us. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, Jung's idea that we're tapping into something more collective and a wider sense of consciousness. And, and in that case, you know, we can dream about things that, that we don't necessarily know or things that might happen later. And there's a, you know, Lots of people, when they're grieving, have visitation dreams from the people that that have just died in their lives. And there's a lot of things about dreams that aren't explainable by what I just said. And I think it's all an and, and, and. I think dreams can be all of those things. And that we, you know, other than, you know, my my best explanation that I just gave you, we don't we don't really know honestly, <laughs> what, what dream, you know, what dreaming really is. It's, it seems to um, give us an opening into a wider consciousness and that it's a, um, can be a spiritual practice that opens up, um, you know, other realms to us that, you know, things that we might've happened that we don't remember in ordinary consciousness and then mm-hmm. things that are even beyond ourselves. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's a lot really. Yeah. Really. And so would it be fair to say that the the dream work that you and and the practitioners that you train are are kind of doing is focusing on that limbic element, that emotional storage, that kind of like it's it's giving us it's a it's a rich source of information for what's really real for us emotionally and somatically. So it's actually something that we can use as a vehicle of like personal evolution and emotional processing, I guess. Is that would that be a true statement? That is um, definitely a, an aspect of it. It really depends on what the person who's people who I train, 
um, are they're they're kind of a mixed bunch. There's a um, mostly therapists that's aimed at at clinicians and and at enabling them to use dream work in their practice in a really constructive and sort of client centered way. But there's also spiritual directors that come to my mm. courses and um, and then just sort of interested dreamers. And so. Uh, some people use it as a spiritual practice. Some use it for in, in, um, helping others, you know, become more in into this um, larger self. Uh, it's mainly aimed at clinicians, though. I would say it's mm. it's just not limited to that. And in a clinical practice, what I find with with uh, working with dreams is that um, when clients bring dreams, they usually are what's mostly most salient. They, they are pictures of what's most salient and they bring the conversation into a much greater depth immediately. There's an intimacy right. and depth that comes with dream material mm -hmm. that is, is, is really profound. And especially for those sessions or those clients that tend to go around in circles and talk about the same types of problems, mm -hmm. the dreams can bring something new and something um, that points forward or creates a level of honesty and uh, depth that isn't usually there. So I mm. find that extremely helpful for people who are who are stuck. Mm -hmm. And they're also a really um, beautiful way to work with trauma memory and uh, trauma in the body because the dreams will picture it uh, often in a way that's not a direct replication of the trauma, although sometimes it does that as well. But um, when things are implicit trauma, early childhood memories um, they, that are held in the body but don't have a way of expressing, they'll often come out in dreams as the person is ready to metabolize them. And you can work with the dream images knowing that it might be related to a, a trauma. It will have a certain feel about it, mm -hmm. but drawing it and talking about it and metabolizing the emotion without actually having to directly describe a trauma memory or even have the explicit memory. You might not mm. have it. So dreaming is a way of metabolizing emotion uh, just in its in itself. Mm -hmm. And so when you work with dreaming, I think it helps that process of metabolizing emotion. And in a, it does it in a way that's that's natural in that the body itself is bringing up what feels important or what it's processing. It's like when we go to sleep, we don't, we're not in control of the <laughs> images that roll out. We're, our, our dreaming life is picking up what's coming from a, from an unedited place, basically. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know if that describes it, but that's. Totally does. <laughs> yeah. And I'm really interested in what my brain is thinking of as directionality, which I'll explain. Um, I've always been interested by people who lucid dream, but always mm -hmm. a bit freaked out because I'm like, I kind of trust the dream to be the dream. I don't know that I want to get involved in the dream. So when you, with your work, are you doing, like, are you trying to influence the dream life or are you letting the dream life influence the, the waking life? What's the relationship for you? Because I'm, I'd love to have a different opinion, but it kind of feels like my dreams feel kind of sacred. I kind of want them to be just them. And I don't actually want to be awake and them messing around with the storyline. I'd love to hear your take on it. Yeah, yeah, I I, I, t I tend to agree with you. I um, when I was working on my book about dream work, I I had quite a few dreams where I was aware that I was dreaming. So there's there's different kinds of lucidity as well. There's the mm. aware that you're dreaming, and then there's a, a, a control over your dream material. And so there there are two pieces of it, and. Um, you know, so I would say that for me, um, my awareness that I was dreaming would then be there's an opening to take control, which is what, what I didn't do. What I did instead was I went, wow, I'm dreaming. I can, I'm writing about dreaming. I'm interested in dreaming. So I want to actually use this um, lucidity to really observe, let mm -hmm. my dream be my dream. Yeah. And I agree. I think they're sacred. I think um, what they have to say when it unfolds is important. And if I decide that I'm going to go and, you know, meet my favorite movie star or have some kind of, you know, um, you know, become a, you know, f famous person or do some, you know, like virtuosic thing, then I feel like I'm not really playing with um, something that's, that's really meant to be more uh, sacred, as you say. Uh, so 
Um, the awareness of dreaming, though, is something uh, that I think really makes dreaming easier to remember. And it does have this co-creative quality that happens when you mm -hmm. do that. Because you know how um, in your, you sometimes have a dream where something really horrible is happening and you go, oh my gosh, I don't want to have that happen. I don't want to, you know, like drive off the cliff or, and, and there's something in you that realizes that it's a dream or that you have some control and you, you can intervene in a way and stop the disaster. Mm -hmm. There's a way that you are kind of lucid in that moment and you are kind of directing it. And I don't think of that as a, as a problem. Um, but you know, there's, there's a whole other school that thinks, you know, well, diving into lucidity takes you into other realms of dreaming. And there's a whole, um, you know, uh, community of lucid dreamers that, that really treat it like a spiritual practice in itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tibetans as well, there's a dream yoga practice where they, you know, cultivate deep spiritual practices using lucidity as a leaping off place. And that I think is interesting, but it's also, uh, I think apart from clinical dream work, I think that is a, um, a personal, almost like a meditative practice that people yeah. can get involved in. And mm -hmm. also dream researchers are very interested in lucidity because of the problem I, I, I talked about, about how mm. hard it is to study dreams. So yeah. if you could have someone become lucid in the sleep lab and give you some feedback mm -hmm. while they're dreaming, that's more uh, valid, the information that's coming directly from them as they're dreaming than mm -hmm. something that they report on later in their, mm -hmm. with their perfect memory mm -hmm. of what happened. Mm -hmm. Although lucid dreaming in a lab that's induced isn't going to be the same as what right. natural dreaming would be. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, the, and then there's also the, the worry that your, your brain is functioning differently when you're dreaming um, lucidly and that your prefrontal cortex is switched on. So do you mm. get the same level of rest? Mm -hmm. Are you sort of half awake? Um, is this good? Is this not? You know, there's all these questions about it. And so for me, what I like to do is I, I, I find that when I'm inviting people to experientially enter their dreams it is a form of dreaming while you're awake. Mm -hmm. And that that ability to be a little bit conscious of dreaming seems to infiltrate the dreaming. And um, in a way, it's it's all right. It's it's okay to be a little bit awake in your dream because you recall it better and you have a lot more um, agency, um, but mm -hmm. you don't have to use it in a in a um, kind of a light way. You know, it mm -hmm. can be just part of the practice. And for, for example, with nightmares, if there's, you know, people have recurrent nightmares and there's the same terrible thing happening over and over, it's nice to be able to go, oh, this is that dream. And I think, you know, today I'm going to confront the monster and I'm going to see what it wants. And, and um, maybe the conversation will um, lead somewhere. Maybe I'll understand something different. And often these create great shifts. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's, it's, it's a, there's a line somewhere. I mean, I'm with you, but I think some, some, some aspects of lucidity are, are useful. Mm -hmm. Well, and I love that you took us into nightmares because that was where I was going next. Cause I'd be really interested to understand, you know, what stimulates a nightmare, what makes a repetitive nightmare, like, cause you, that's what you hear a lot. Um, and what, what, what did you discover on nightmares and what is the way to work with them? Wow. Okay. How yeah, basically, this is your, um, bit, like, I want your doctorate thesis in 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I can do this. I can do this. Um, okay. So, yeah, my doctoral thesis was, um, I was working with a group of refugees. I was, actually, at the time, I was training a, a trauma therapist that worked at a, um, uh, a trauma clinic in Vancouver that was, work that, that basically treated refugees that had um, post-traumatic stress injury and we're, we're coming and looking for help and nightmares were their, their single biggest problem. They would say that if they could have one thing change, it would be that their dreams would, uh, their dream life would lighten up. And so, um, I was already training them to use focusing, um, mm -hmm. and, and embodied is focusing is a beautiful, gentle way to work with trauma. Mm -hmm. And so I asked if I could do my, my, um, research, my doctoral research there. And they said, Yes, and I trained their clinicians to uh, work with nightmares in a the way that I described, basically, by starting with uh, a little bit different in nightmares. I would start with getting into a calm place, using focusing, clearing a space to start with a calm body, because 
how we um, experience things is a lot depends on the state we're in. Our state, mm. you know, our mood and our experiences are state dependent. And you, as a as an SE practitioner, would be well aware of this. So, um, getting calm and then bringing in the um, the nightmare and allowing it to dream forward. So, what happens? in nightmares is st st typically in recurrent nightmares is that the dream will, will get to a certain place. It's sort of the most terrifying place and it will wake the dreamer up. This is the definition of a nightmare. Mm. And in people with um, post-traumatic stress, the, um, the nightmare, uh, the recurrent nightmare is, is really one of their biggest problems because it wreaks havoc on their sleep and their mood. And so allowing the dream um, once they're like um, in a calm place, find some resource, find some help, whether it's in the dream or whether you need to ins instill a sense of, of, of resourcing and then allowing the dream to carry forward, the, the, the dream then has a, a, a usually um, a, the, it, the way that people tend to finish the dream is in a more constructive way. Although you don't specifically ask for that, you kind of set it up so it's most likely that they will and let the dream, instead of being stopped um, in that same place, to allow them just to, you know, let the dream naturally play forward. And this idea is, it's called rescripting now. It's become the most um, single, uh, most common element in current nightmare treatment uh, it was an idea that I took from Jung um, in Dreaming the Dream Onward, this active mm. imagination process. But unbeknownst to me, at the same time, there was this technique called imagery rehearsal therapy, mm -hmm. which is a cognitive um, behavioral intervention, but asks people to um, basically finish the dream, write down a new ending. And so, and there's been a lot of empirical research on that method that shows that it's really effective at treating nightmares. And, and what I found in my study um, was that people's nightmares changed. And in my practice as well, after usually one session, sometimes mm. just one session was enough to take this long-term recurrent nightmare and shift it. And I think it's, you know, partly because you're giving um, the dream somewhere to go yeah. and you're, you're helping someone um, instill a sense of calm into the process and mastery um, but what happens, I think, and I, I, I published a paper on this in my doctoral research became a, a, an article that was published. Um, and so it, you can look it up and I'll you probably put the links or something. Yeah, so we'll do just that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So what it, what it does, I think, is that it, what happens is that when we have a recurrent nightmare, there's, there's a way that our body gets really activated. Um, the, 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 the stress and the fear uh, surge through our bodies and enough to wake us up. Mm -hmm. And then we remember it and we wake up in this, in this, you know, like heart pounding, cold sweat, all those classic fear responses. Mm -hmm. And when we uh, invite someone to imagine the dream forward, I think that what happens is that the physiological response, the nervous system response is, is not as strong and the dream carries forward. Kind of we've seeded a, a, an ending, we've given it somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. And when the dream carries forward and, and doesn't create an, a, a huge surge that wakes the person up, they may have been having that dream, but they won't remember. So they'll they'll basically tell me the dream is gone. It mm. might not be gone. It might mm -hmm. still be. Uh, I think the dreaming is is a way of metabolizing the traumatic situation, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, so it might still be happening for a while. But it's happening um, in a more constructive way, where it lets mm. it, where it gets to finish. And so that's sort of my um, was my doctoral research in a in a in a nutshell. I mean, there's a, there's a lot more I could say about it, but of course, no, I mean, these are huge topics and huge questions, so I'm not helping massively, but I feel like there's a, just speak to us a little bit about that processing. Do we always assume that there is a trauma underneath a, a nightmare? Do we always assume if not, you know, capital T, T there's some kind of emotional stuckness that's happening under, un, underneath the nightmare? Well, yeah, I think so. I think that's a simple, a simple, a simple way to say it. I mm -hmm. uh, recently did this article on nightmares and the nervous system, and I'm looking at what who has nightmares and what tends to be the kind of precursors to nightmares. And uh, in in nightmare terminology and research, there's the 
traumatic nightmares. And then there's what they call the idiopathic nightmares, which are idiopathic, meaning we don't really know where they're coming from. And so the trauma nightmares are usually obvious in that they have some elements that are similar to the actual trauma. Sure. And what to know about that is the closer your nightmare is to the actual trauma event, the less metabolized it is. And uh-huh. so when dreams start to, when dreams exactly replicate a trauma, yeah. that's sort of the classic post-traumatic dream. Yeah. That's, that's a sign that it's just not shifting and it doesn't change in their memory. And so when you work with a dream in the way I describe, and I have a lot more detail about the protocol in my most recent article about how to work with the nightmare. Mm-hmm. When you do that, what happens is the dreams start to change. Yeah. They start to shift. And then you know that you're doing something. And it's actually a really um, clear uh, a clear sense that, ah, the dreams are shifting. It means the way the body's holding the trauma is shifting. And dreams are not something that you can... Um, actively control so you know that it's a a, an authentic shift and 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 so it's it's really kind of a uh, a nice way to to work with the trauma and to get um some clear indication that it's helping yeah and so what i think is that um the nightmares the trauma nightmares it's clear where the source is the idiopathic nightmares what i you know i did a lot of research into looking at who has nightmares um as children who has nightmares as adults and I do think they're all uh, trauma related mm. because uh, what doesn't get included in those um, questionnaires about your trauma history are things that are traumatic, but aren't necessarily um, viewed as such. Early childhood trauma isn't always recalled. It's more implicit. The things that are traumatic to a small child um, may not look traumatic to someone in their life that could be mm. like, um, maternal separation, like, um, you know, mom gets sick and has to go to in hospital for a few weeks. Mm-hmm. And as a very little one, you think she's gone for good. And it's a deep trauma, but it wouldn't be labeled as such. Or they, you know, their, their pet dies or something, something that really devastates a small child um, could lead to nightmares, could lead to a sense of, um, uh, you know, the nervous system being anxiety and activation that causes nightmares that isn't, just labeled as trauma, but I do feel like the the physiology of nightmares is it's a fear response. It is an anxiety. It comes with it comes with an activation, and that's something that I uh, really looked at in my uh, most recent article. Um, in it's it's called solving the nightmare mystery because what I'm mm-hmm. looking at is well, the current nightmare treatments are um, they're they're being studied in you know different ways and they could definitely use more research but Mm. some of them work some of them don't Mm. we don't necessarily know everything about why they're working or what particular pieces of the therapy are working so Mm. I was thinking because I um have been interested in the polyvagal theory and the nervous system that it is the nervous system is implicated in these nightmares and that if you can you see it that way then you can use some of the um polyvagal theory um, ideas to to calm the nervous system. And when you do that, that the nightmares will be reduced. And that seems to be the case. Mm-hmm. It's it's early days, but I, I in all the nightmare literature, I didn't see anybody refer to polyvagal theory. Hmm. So I just decided that it, it really is something that probably is relevant. And mm-hmm. there is evidence of it, but it's piecemeal at this point yeah, and uh, yeah. so I just thought I'd put it out there as a, as a starting place and yeah part of the reason I got interested believe it or not is because I was the editor of Jan Winhall's book um <gasps> the felt sun's polyvagal model course, so yeah. um <laughs> and you had heard the name you know when you do this thing it's just like I've t- like, this has come across my horizon before there we go <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I combed through that book uh, manuscript um, many, many times and worked mm. with her on it. So, so it was really um, present. It was really top of mind for me. Yeah, and the application to nightmares seems really evident. And right, what I discovered in that is, you know, like the looked at the adverse childhood experience experiences studies and looked at how really um, childhood trauma is very common. And mm. so the idiopathic nightmares that they say are just kind of maybe based on your um, personality type or certain traits or sensitivities 
Um, that may well be true, but how is it that a person gets a sensitive nervous yeah. system? Yeah. Probably, I think it's early adversity. And yeah. so those are the ideas I'm playing with. And like, these are all ideas at this point. There's nothing, you know, really uh, proven with, yeah. beyond doubt, but it feels true to me. And the, you know, the nightmares really are um, the nervous system's expression of of activation and, or it can be a uh, um, dissociation and the, the type of dreams we have. Right. Thing I noticed, which is really interesting is looking at the, um, the classic nervous system responses of there's the fight flight and um, the immobility responses. Mm -hmm. And the, that if you look at the nightmare content, uh, the vast majority of nightmares are either running away from something or they're fighting something and battling something, or they're a, a frozen, numb, immo immobilized um, mm. response. If I looked at some of the content analysis of like the most common nightmare themes, and it maps yeah. pretty, pretty yeah. neatly onto those, those nervous system responses. So I thought, mm -hmm. wow, you know, almost every nightmare has, if you look at the content, has an element of this nervous system um, expression. So mm. Um, it helped me in a way to inform treatment because one thing that the nightmare treatments don't do is differentiate between um, an activation and an immobilization. And we uh, know that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the immobilization has got more dissociation. It's a it's a longer path to healing, and there's a lot more um, that needs to be done in that. Um, you know, it's a it's a a lot. There's a lot more resourcing that needs to happen, and more patience with the process. So. Uh, I, I feel like there's a lot of information in the dreams about the state of someone's nervous system mm -hmm. and not just nightmares, actually all dreams. I'm beginning to think it, it, that they are a picture of, of our nervous system state in, in all cases. And so it made total sense to me because, you know, in order to be truly sleeping and, and going through all the stages appropriately and like having restful sleep, you really do need to be in a parasympathetic rest and digest, you know, dorsal but healthy dorsal vagal mode and if your nervous system has something that would like not fully allow that to be a safe space so you know effectively being in a coma uh, under threat like for a, a long time not the safest space if you feel like there is a, a legitimate threat outside so it kind of to me with my understanding and my knowledge of like the polyvagal model and all of that it kind of seems to make total sense that it would be linked but it it strikes me that the the challenges of study here mean that we're always kind of like, and unless we can, I don't know, track the nervous system activity and then get a self-reported take or, or map the brain scan, it feels like the challenges of dream study is like <laughs> it, it, the inherent problem in the, in the, in the yes. this is an unconscious yeah. state. It feels like exactly. we're it's like consciousness the trying to study itself. It's not that easy to study. Yeah. But at the same time, clinically, I, I, I feel like... Um, that is really a very nice to have um, the the sort of um, some real strong support for those yeah. links, and I think that the dream researchers that's that's their bailiwick, and there and there really are you know advancing, but there that that way of of learn of of just learning things and and showing things it's very incremental, and you can only do little baby steps at a time, and it's it's not my my strong interest is mainly how do I take information that they that they are getting and that that I am learning about um, from various places and apply that to to treating the nightmares yeah. using the dreams and the information dreams bring to help a person uh, move forward in their lives and to mm -hmm. recover from trauma and to metabolize those feelings and mm -hmm. and I think the dreams are trying to do that so if we just use the dreams as an ally we can help the dreams do what they're already trying to do like they're yeah. a very natural process and they happen through throughout human history throughout um and um animal his you know animals all mammals dream um, maybe even birds dream. And so there's something universal about it. And there has to be a reason we dream. Yeah. And that seems um, like a, you know, evolution would have, you know, basically um, stopped dreaming if it wasn't doing something really helpful. Yeah. So I, f I feel like that um, aligning with the dream dreaming process is going to help us in a way that maybe has, um, a deeper connection to our to our body sense mm -hmm. 
than we might have if we stay with our with our mind. And our mind can lead us astray in really, really so many ways. And I, I feel like this embodied experiential way that I like to approach therapy and, and dream work is getting to more of our um, the uh, authentic felt sense of things. I, mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir and that you have that kind of approach mm -hmm. as well, but it's not everybody that thinks that way. And it's mm -hmm. certainly not a universal approach to uh, healing, but mm -hmm. I've found it to be um, when people have especially implicit trauma, which I've done a lot of work with, things that are wrong that they don't understand why they do things the way they do and haven't got a way out that the um, the body and the dreams and that um, information that's coming from the bottom up is the way forward. It really is. Our bodies aren't trying to make us miserable. They're trying to help us. Their dreams are trying to help us. So it's about aligning with that and teaching, I think, clinicians and, and dreamers as well to turn toward dreaming, not be afraid of it, but really think about, um, you know, what it's bringing, to, you know, to go back to the beginning, to be in service to the dream. The dream has um, got um, a, a, an odd way of presenting things. So it can feel nonsensical and it can feel um, scary, but what I've found is if you turn toward a dream image and really just with curiosity and respect and, um, you know, with a sort of equanimity without a, um, immediately judging it to be good or bad, that the things that unfold are profound for people. There's such a richness and it, it taps into uh, not just the embodied state, but our imagine, imaginative state. And mm -hmm. so it, it, it gives us a wider field to play in. Mm -hmm. Than the, the mm -hmm. typical, oh, here's the problem, what's the answer? That <laughs> right. boxes you in. And yeah. this opens things up. Mm. So I know that my listeners will be thinking, I don't dream. <laughs> so what about the people who have been sitting through this thinking, but I don't dream, I don't have nightmares. What's happening for those people? I'm sure you're going to say what everyone says to them, which is you do dream, you just don't remember it. How do we develop a better relationship if we are the non-dreamer or, or if we're the, I dream once in a blue moon, but I don't, how do we change that reality to, to be able to develop a relationships with our dreaming, dreaming world? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I get that <laughs> question asked a lot. And yes, mm -hmm. everybody dreams. Uh, probably about 90 minutes or more per night, like a feature mm -hmm. film, basically. Mm -hmm. And so the, the the way the REM cycles work is they're longer and longer toward morning. So mm -hmm. when you wake up in the morning, you'll have just had your, your longest chunk of dreaming. So if you want to remember your dreams, the best time to remember them or to catch a dream is right when you first wake up. There will mm -hmm. be dream material there. So how you wake up can really... Um, uh, impact whether you remember a dream or not. So don't, if you don't, if you just leap out of bed and your your mind immediately gets busy onto what you're doing, the um, the dream that was there will will disappear. Mm -hmm. So I suggest uh, starting by when you first wake up, just lying really still and just seeing, you know, is there any dream material here? And and there might be just wispy images at first. If you're not used to remembering your dreams, it might be something that you catch that's doesn't feel very substantial. But what I would suggest is to, before you move, is, is lie there and let your, um, let your mind, you know, imprint it. Imagine it two or three times. Don't assume you're going to remember because it's so easy. It's, it's like a, it's at the edge of the sort of what's conscious and what's, what's, you know, what's implicit. And it's really easy for that stuff to slip back underground. So it, I would say just, you know, even if it's just a wispy image, just notice, okay, there's a girl on a swing or whatever it is. And, and you know, I, I suggest three times you, you, you walk through whatever it is that you have in your image there, because dreaming, um, is not laid down in explicit memory. And so what you're doing is transferring it to your explicit memory. Um, we don't recall what we dream. We recall the things that when our, we're first waking up or first falling asleep, when, you're, when there's a crossover and you can still recall, but when we're actually in deep dreaming, unless we're lucid, the tape recorder is not on. So you're trying to catch them in this in-between state. So, mm -hmm. And then I would say also set an intention, like get a notebook by your bed. Go, I'm going to remember my dreams. You might want to even um, 
have a, like a, a practice before you go to go to sleep, an incubation process, they call it, where you go, okay, I'm going to have, I'm going to remember my dreams tonight. I'm going to have some good dreams and, and um, <laughs> set that intention, mm -hmm. write down whatever you can remember, pay attention to your dreams. I mm -hmm. noticed that the more you do that, the more the, the dream recollection will come. Mm. Um, napping is also a very good um, way to catch dreams because mm. you don't get into as you don't go into that deep sleep. You go more into, especially if you're sleep deprived, you'll go right into REM. Yeah. And they're they're kind of easier to catch. And there's this yeah. sort of in between state you're trying to cultivate. So mm -hmm. even uh, like daydreaming, if you if you don't um, have dream recall when you're sleeping, even just to let yourself have a reverie that's non-directed, like um, you know it, you know like a meditative kind of um, place. And I start all my classes with this kind of practice where. We'll, we'll go into a, um, a focusing exercise where we clear space, just go in, 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 into our internal space and clear it. And then I'll just ask them to um, imagine that it's just an empty space or an open field or something and let, let something come, let an image come, invite an image to come, and then really just pay attention to what comes and don't prejudge it or assume that you, you want a better image. You know, I don't want that mouse. I'd rather have an eagle or just go like, let an image come onto that, that field. And, and you can treat that material the daydream material not sort of active fantasizing but daydream material is very like a dream it's not really coming from a different place so mm. sometimes if people don't have night dreams I ask them to use daydreams mm -hmm. and you can get a similar kind of um, information from them mm -hmm. Great. I love this. Awesome. So you've mentioned it a few times and you mentioned it then in terms of your classes. Tell us a little bit about the course that you offer for these people. You mentioned that it's not just for clinicians, but what does it kind of look like? What's the, how long is it? What is, what's the journey through your course? So it's, it takes, um, well, it's been a year long, although I'm starting and the, the, a new cohort just started, but I'm starting the next one in September and I've changed it a little bit. It's a, it's a, um, there's a couple of options. There's like a six month course with the class meets every month. And each session is like a Zoom session of a two and a half hours where I talk about a dream work practice, the kinds of things I've been talking about, but just in more detail. Mm -hmm. And then we'll actually work with the dream. And in between sessions, I've got a whole, um, uh, I've got a book that really follows the dream course material um, pretty closely, and then a, a bunch of recorded material. So I do all the lecture kind of on a recording so that we don't use our class time for that for the sort of didactic information yeah. during the class time we it's all experiential we do some mm -hmm. day dream work and then we'll do demonstrate dream work and I'll teach dr group dream work. And so we, we meet and um, kind of play with these ideas. And I, I sort of do it in a logical order so that people can start working with each other. I pair people up with um, a partner or a, or a triad. And then between sessions, they can practice with each other. And I start with, you know, the, the initial sort of skills and slowly get deeper and deeper into it so that by the end, people feel pretty comfortable working with client dreams or working with their own dreams or each other's dreams. And uh, yeah, and it's a, a small classes. I, I Basically my limit is who I can see on a Zoom screen. So I don't have 500 people. I just want like 20 people so that I, so it, the class is intimate enough that people feel comfortable dream sharing. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I can see everyone. I don't want to teach people and not have a relationship. So, mm -hmm. so I, um, I cut the, I cut I really keep my uh, classes in a manageable size. And mm. it's really, yeah, it, by the end of it, you know, I've had, I've had people come from different schools of dream work who have been much more, a lot of people come with dream work training where they're um, no dream work training or training where they're like really treating the dream as an intellectual exercise and yeah. have a, um, an approach where, you know, they're looking at the symbology and there, there's a, a more of a heady approach and, mm. and it, they seem to all kind of come around mm -hmm. by the, you know, it takes a while. It's not something I, you could teach in a month or two, but they start to really feel into how the dream is an experiential journey and how valuable that is and mm. start to be more uh, relaxed and allowing the dream just to unfold and mm. not have it all figured out, you know? And so <laughs> it's, um, it's really enjoyable, honestly, the, the, the dream sessions. And I have a um, dream group in between and uh, uh, um, some other sort of activities people can join in, like a dream sketch group my, uh, my colleague runs. And so, yeah, lots of, lots of ways to dive into the dreams. But the main thing is the, um, 
yeah, the monthly, the monthly meeting and then mm-hmm. a bunch a bunch of stuff around it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. And you also mentioned, and we'll put links to that course in the show notes. You mentioned the book, which we will also put in the show notes. Um, you also, you deliver masterclasses and sort of free things that people can get a taste, don't you? Yes, because uh, so a number of people have said, well, before I commit to a, a full year of training, I want a sense of how you teach and, you know, a little bit about this. And so I've started doing about once a month or so, uh, 90 minute webinars where I'll pick an aspect of dream work, like finding the help in a dream or entering a dream character. And I will present it and somebody will um, offer their dream and I'll demonstrate the the practice. And so I've been recording those and and they're they're free to sign up. And I think that I charge like a nominal fee of $20 Mm -hmm. for the existing recordings. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've done a couple now, I've got another one, Um, it'll be, this coming week, which will be before, you know, it'll be before, before this, mm-hmm. um, yeah, before this was released, but um, they'll, I'm going to keep doing them because they're so well received. I get lots and lots of mm-hmm. people like them and lots of good feedback. So that's a really good way to kind of dip a toe in is to just yeah. um, have a listen to um, those even starting probably more, most logically starting at the first one and, and then listening to them or just joining in where we are. Right. Um, yeah. Well, I'll make sure the link to the, historic masterclasses is also in the show notes because I think that if this kind of thing grabs people it's really yeah they want this taste they want to understand and and to like get a taste of how you teach would be great so I will make sure that that's Mm -hmm. available is there anything else that I need to ask you that I haven't asked you today I just want to before you answer that question I just want to say like I class myself as someone who very rarely remembers her dreams like dreams is not a thing that I have a relationship with and I'm kind of I think in part there's that bias of like, oh, well, even if I did remember, I'd just go to some textbook and like work out the symbology of this. It doesn't, it's never been a thing that I kind of wanted to do. But today I'm kind of really inspired because you just made me realize that it's very linked to what I already do with all of the somatics and all of the polyvagal stuff and all of So it's like, I'm going to go and get that book and put it by my bed and make sure that I wake up in the morning and like really feel into it. So thank you. I have deeply personally valued you sharing all of this today. Is there anything else you would like to share with my listeners before we close for today? Um, Yeah, I would just say, um, this is sort of similar to what I've been saying all along, is that really to um, treat your dreams as a, a friend, even when they're, you know, even when they don't seem that way, be really curious about them and develop a cultivated relationship with them and it will really enrich your life and deepen your uh, understanding of of um you know the things that are you know really um sacred to you it 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 drops you into a deeper realm and i i feel like people there's a there's a a bias that we carry i think about dreams where people will wake up from a dream and because they've got this funny way of of presenting things that it's easy to dismiss them Mm -hmm. and they're also they also point to things that challenge us they point Mm -hmm. to things that are a little bit repressed or a little bit problematic or things about ourselves that we don't love to look at you know Mm -hmm. um so there's a tendency to dismiss them because they make us uncomfortable and because they don't make sense and so I, i would say that you try to get past that inherent bias and try some of the the um techniques that i suggest to really engage with the with with the dream environments and the dream characters and let them open up to you, draw pictures of them, and tell people them. And I, I just I, I I really can honestly say that it's going to enrich your life. You're going to learn things that are valuable from doing that. Mm. I love it. I hope everyone's inspired to do that. Thank you so much for spending the time with me today, Leslie. I have really enjoyed our chat. Oh, so did I. Thank you so much for having me on your on your podcast. It's been <laughs> such a pleasure to talk to you. Now, I have no shame in saying that after that recording, I have been having more dreams and paying more attention. It's remarkable how much when you pay attention to stuff like this, it can really revolutionize your experience of these things. So I hope that you've been inspired by this episode and that you yourself can take the opportunity to look and research and be involved with your dream life in a way that helps your waking life to evolve. If you'd like any more information about Leslie Ellis, please head to the show notes where you will find the links for her book, her website, and all of the work that we spoke about today. And with that, all that's left to say is thank you for joining me on the Unveiled podcast, and we will see you again next week.